Hi, my name is John Pemberton, diabetes dietitian and also creator of the Glucose Never Lies, which is basically an education program just in case my kids ever get type 1 diabetes. So this session is looking at continuous glucose monitoring exercise. So I've been fortunate enough to go to um, the International Society for Paediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, um, the British Society for Paediatric um, Endocrinology and Diabetes, um, presenting on CGM and exercise and also automated insulin delivery systems. But what I realise is I haven't put this down for the people who matter the most, and that's the people with diabetes. So I'm going to try and work through this in as simple a way as possible to hopefully give some tips, tricks and ideas for managing activity and exercise. But before we get started, this is for informational purposes only. If there's things that you think you would like to try in this blog, please discuss with your healthcare provider. I'm not your dietitian, I'm not your doctor, I'm just here providing information. So please exercise caution. So what we're going to work through is just quickly what continuous glucose monitoring is, and especially in relation to exercise. Something that's new in terms of thinking about using activity to actually improve time and range. And then how to think about you can structure an exercise plan both for pumps and injections. And then finally, some of the resources um, that we use, you can see those and then have access to those. So I hope you find this useful. Take about 20 minutes, but hopefully it's going to be worth your time. So just as a little recap, as we know, when you take a finger prick, you puncture the skin, the blood comes up to the surface and the glucose that's in the blood is what you're measuring. Whereas a continuous glucose monitoring sensor is measuring the glucose in the interstitial space or fat tissue and it's about five minutes behind at resting conditions. However, when you exercise, this interstitial space expands, the dynamics change massively and you can see that the lag changes from about five minutes up to say 12 or 24 minutes. And this shows it nicely here. If you've got the blood glucose in red, if it's dropping rapidly during exercise, as it, the faster it drops, the bigger the gap that goes between the sensor reading and the glucose reading. And similarly, if you then have lots of glucose, you will go high very quickly on the blood glucose, but be falling behind on the sensor. So we do know that during exercise, the accuracy of the continuous glucose monitoring does deteriorate. So it is important to bear that in mind that yes, there is a lag time of five minutes while you sat on your backside, but when you're moving your backside, it's more like 10 to 20 minutes. So you have to be a little bit more careful. So bearing that in mind, this is just exactly what I've said. The lag time increases from five to maybe 12 to 24 minutes due to lots of different factors. And the, the MARD or mean absolute relative difference and accuracy measurement goes from roughly about 10%, anywhere from 14 to 46%, certainly in children and young people exercising on a treadmill. So some words of caution is you can set the low glucose alert a little bit higher at 5.5 millimoles per litre or 100 milligrams per deciliter. You can set the fall alert, but there is nothing wrong. If you've got one or two arrows pointing straight down, check your finger prick to manage your exercise. Yes, you can use the trend arrows, but you're going to probably need to do a finger prick to be sure it exactly where you are. You know that I have type 1 diabetes. When I exercise, I rely on finger pricks rather than continuous glucose monitoring because I know this information. Continuous glucose monitoring is absolutely amazing um, for pretty much 99% of the time. But during exercise, when you've got fast moving glucose levels, you want to think about potentially doing a finger prick. Now, if I've got a steady arrow when I'm exercising, I'm happy to do that. Or just an angled arrow, happy to use that. But if I've got arrows going straight down or straight up, it's a definite finger prick for me because I want to be sure exactly where I'm at when I make my treatment decisions. But everyone's different. you got the information. You can decide for yourself. When you're thinking around what the arrows tell you, think in terms of 10 minutes, not in terms of 20 or 30 minutes. And these arrows for the different systems give you an idea of where the glucose will be in 10 minutes time or potentially where it already is with the finger prick if you did a finger prick. So for example, if you've got a level six, a level of six or 110 milligrams per deciliter, it's gonna be about the same if the arrow's going across. Whereas if you've got a double arrow down, that six is either gonna be four or that 110 is gonna be down to 70 in the next 10 minutes or it may already be there on the finger prick. So these arrows will tell you in 10 minutes time where things are going to be so you can project ahead and decide what you'll want to do, what safety precautions you might want to think about or if you're playing along nice and safe, you can leave it there. But please think in terms of 10 minutes. If you've got a level of six or 110, and then you project forward 30 minutes with a double arrow down, well, you can't go from six to zero, and you can't go from 110 to zero. So thinking in terms of 30 minutes is just way too long. Keep it to 10 minutes, and then you can make better decisions. 
So this is something, if you've got access to the um, ISPAD members website, you will have seen the draft guidance for the exercise 2022 um, has been up there and it's now been gone forward and it's just awaiting publication. And this is likely to be in there unless it's been changed. Um, that moderate intensity aerobic activity, such as walking and cycling, for 15 to 45 minutes between meals safely lowers glucose levels that are above 10.6 or 190 milligrams per deciliter. So this is the first time that a guidance is actually suggesting using activity the other way around. Everything you think about activity and exercise, it's always all oh, the risk of going low, got to put in case some, some prevention strategies to prevent, prevent you going hypo. However, we know we're all aiming for 70% time in range, and we've actually got one of the most powerful tools imaginable to drop the glucose level when it's high back into target. And this is the first suggestion of how you can think about doing it. And this comes from a bit of research. Now this looks like a complicated paper, but hopefully I'm going to show you um, what happened. So they, there's 120 people combined children and young people actually and what they did was they um, did, act, did activity two hours after eating 45 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity activity walking at a fast pace or cycling at a reasonable pace and what you can see is in this blue line here cuts off the people who started with a glucose level above 10.6 or above 190 and what you can see here there are loads of open triangles and there are colored in red triangles and during the 45 to 60 minutes the ones in the red triangles are the ones who went hypo and the ones in the open triangles didn't go hypo and what you will notice on the next graph down is this is how much the glucose level dropped during that 45 to 60 minutes so what this shows you, if you do 45 minutes of activity when your glucose level is above 10.6 you've got a good chance of getting bang into target without too much risk of going low. But if you actually up that to say above 200 milligrams per deciliter or 11.1 .1 millimoles per litre, only three of the 30 odd people actually went low. So if you were above 200 or 11.1, .1, you could safely go walking for 40, 45 minutes and get the glucose level down in double quick time. If you think about how long it would take a correction dose to bring you down when your glucose level is say 13 or 14, you're looking at two hours, two and a half, maybe three hours for that to work. You can get this down in 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes with a bit of activity. So putting that simply for you, realistically, no one is going to do 45 minutes of active walking when your glucose level is high. And you don't need to do 45 minutes because you don't want to come all the way from 12 right down to 4. You just want to come back below 10. So the simple way of thinking it about is 10 minutes of activity, such as fast walking or cycling or playing, will drop the glucose level by 2 or 35 milligrams per deciliter. So if you're 11, you're only gonna need 10 minutes to bring you back down to nine. If you're 14, 20 minutes to bring you back down to 10. And that's exactly where I work, what we teach. We teach something called game, and it's found to be the strongest predictor of improving time and range at six months after education. And the basic idea is, Set your high alert according to what percentage of time and range you want. So if you want 70% time and range, you're probably going to have to set your high alert at 12. And then when the glucose alert goes off, if it's possible and you want to do it, you could actually use um, between meals after you've eaten some walking, cycling, playing, in the garden, dancing to YouTube, whatever, depending on the glucose level and trend arrow. So let's just say you're 12 and you've got an arrow going across. That would take 15 minutes to bring it back below 10. So a 15 minute walk would bring it down from a 12 to below 10 in 15 to 20 minutes. And again, think how long a correction dose would take. So you don't really need to remember all this. All you need to remember is 10 minutes of activity will drop your glucose level by two millimoles per liter or 35 milligrams per deciliter between meals when you've had a bowl of say a couple of, couple of hours before, maybe you've undercounted your carbs or you've had a high fat meal, for example. And what happens is the activity opens a side door to your muscle cells to allow glucose to go in. And also by doing the activity, it pumps insulin to the muscle cells so more glucose can be dragged out of the blood. So, as we're all aiming to try and get 70% time in range, we know correction doses work, they just work very slowly. Whereas if you use activity to bring the glucose down faster, you may only need 10 or 15 minutes of walking um, occasionally to actually improve that time in range significantly. So this is new stuff that's coming out. It's thinking about activity differently, not about, oh, I'm gonna go low, maybe about when I'm high, I can get back into target. Here's just a really simple um, video that has been done by a company called Loved By. Um, they've got a product called Nudge and they've developed something to really simply put that message across. Probably takes 20 seconds to explain what it took me about five minutes to.
Should have probably just played that video at the start and I could have saved myself some time. But now you understand the theory and that is just a, a simple way of understanding it, hopefully. Another simple way of thinking about activity is we know as a general population, we're meant to be doing at least half an hour a day activity as adults, 60 minutes a day as a young person, and um, realistically we're getting nowhere near those levels. So we know when we have diabetes, realistically, the insulin generally doesn't match the food very effectively, which means when you have a high carb meal, your glucose level goes up and then comes down. If you put in 10 minutes of activity after eating, often that flattens the profile because it allows the insulin to get pumped to the muscles so it can get used more effectively. The amount of young people that I've seen, I can always tell who walks to school. The people who walk to school, the people who've got a profile like this, the people who eat Cocoa Pops and then don't walk to school and get a lift are the ones who look like this. So you've got some ideas. It even helps when you have a balanced meal to put activity in afterwards. And if you have a problem with high fat meals like pizzas and spaghetti, etc., three, four hours after, you can either split the insulin dose and you can also chuck in some activity as well to get that insulin working more effectively to bring that glucose level down. So don't think of exercise as getting on the leotard and doing loads of squats or you know pushing yourself really hard. We're talking here about fast paced walking talking here about gentle cycling. We're talking about playing, um, dancing YouTube, playing out football out in the garden. Simple things that don't require you to go crazy, but 10 to 15 minutes can make a huge difference on improving your timing range and probably reducing your insulin requirements also. Okay, so we've got continuous glucose monitor. The old advice used to be, so for half an hour's worth of activity, if your glucose levels are between 5.7 and 6.9, that's about 100 to about 130, you'd need about 15 grams of additional carbs. If it's a bit lower than that, you'd need 20. If it's between seven and 15, probably nothing. And if it's higher, then obviously check for ketones. But now we've got trend arrows in the business that tell us whether we're going high, higher quickly or lower quickly. And a simple way to think about this is if you've got a double arrow down, you're going to need to double the amount. So if you're six with a double arrow down, that's going to be 30 instead of 15, for example. If you're in this level with a double arrow down, you're going to be wanting 40 rather than 20 grams of carbs. So that's just a simple way of doing it. And on the flip side, if you're 6.9 with a double arrow up, you're not going to need anything for half an hour. So you can get some simple ideas here. A double arrow down means you either double it, or if you double arrow up, you don't have any. And then in between, you've got um, some, some ideas of what percentages you can change your usual carb amounts. Obviously for children and young people, that's a bit more difficult because 15 grams may be way too much for a 20 or 30 kilo kid. Now there's this rather complicated looking table from a, a consensus guidance, but fortunately Othma Moses group are actually putting this into an app that will be available sooner rather than later, which basically takes this type of idea, puts it into an algorithm, puts it into an app. So when you've got your Dexcom, for example, and you're reading a six with an arrow going down and you've put your weight in, it will tell you how many grams of carbs you would need. In the meantime, if you don't want to wait for that, at the end I've got a QR code where you can um, pop it in or you can just go to the glucoseneverlies.com and look in resources and you can find these very simple um, PDFs where you can put in your weight, the amount of time you're doing the activity and then you can choose which option that you would use um, for your treatments for exercise and then it will tell you depending on your glucose level and your trend arrow, how many grams of carbs you would need for that activity. So that's a simple way of doing it if you want to access those, access those resources. Just go to the glucoseneverlies.com, look at the resources section, and you'll see carbohydrate tables there. Okay, thinking about making a plan. So that's a big intro, intro to kind of saying continuous glucose monitoring, Think about activity and get as much as you can just to improve your diabetes control. And then if you're someone who likes exercise and you want to plan for exercise, this is what to think about. So obviously you've got your own goals at the beginning. We need to think about the intensity, type, duration of activity. Definitely think about basal and bolus insulin conditions. Are you planning it? Is it unplanned? And then previous impact of things like previous day's hypos. And then obviously with CGM, we've got to think about glucose arrows and trend arrows. So, you know, there's a lot to think about. One thing I do want to say here is if you've got plans that already work and your glucose level stays in target, you do not need to change anything. Simple principle, the glucose never lies. If your continuous glucose monitor shows that you stay nice and steady during exercise, you stay away from hypos, continue doing what you're doing. But if you're having real problems with either highs or lows, then maybe there's some things in here that you could get for information and discuss with your healthcare professionals. First thing to think about is the type of exercise activity you've done. This fantastic graphic by uh, Mike Riddell in a recent publication basically gives you an idea of the different types of activity, 
what usually happens with your glucose level. So endurance activity at a steady state, you generally tend to drop. Explosive things like sprinting, powerlifting, um, judo, the stress hormones generally tend to increase your glucose level. Things that are mixed have a bit of endurance and a bit of sprinting, so like football, netball, basketball, often have a bit of both. And it could go up, it could go down, depending on the intensity. And then the same with resistance training. You've got sort of spouts of doing sets and then rest, and it's generally over a longer period of time. And again, that might go up, it might go down, depending on how hard the session is. I know certainly for me on a leg day, if I really went hard on the squats, I would be going higher. Other days where I was doing the Hollywood biceps and... Uh, chest I'll probably be going low with not using as many muscle groups so again this gives you an idea of what type of activity you're doing what may you expect with your glucose level but the most important thing about this is this is what would happen generally under basal conditions where there's not much bolus insulin around however if you throw in insulin for a meal and do exercise or activity within two hours of eating pretty much you're going to be going on the lower side because We've just discussed there when you do activity, it pumps the insulin around to the muscles, the glucose, glucose gets dragged out of the blood much faster. Therefore, if you're doing endurance and you're doing it under conditions where there's lots of bolus insulin, you're gonna be on this one right down here. If you're doing mis mixed exercise with lots of bolus insulin on board, you're gonna be going on the lower side. Same with the resistance training. So you need to know whether you've given insulin um, for a meal in the previous two hours or if it's gonna be more than two hours. And ideally, if you can, Keeping active, ex proper planned exercise but three hours after your last meal gets you into pretty much only basal insulin conditions working. Therefore, your glucose response to exercise is a lot more predictable. And also, you're generally more likely run closer to staying stable than an exaggerated drop or an exaggerated rise. So that's probably the key tip. If it's possible, plan your exercise three hours after you've eaten. Not always possible, but if it is possible, it's well worth considering. What you have to also think about, that's during the exercise, is after the exercise. This is a bit of a complicated slide, but basically this shows people did exercise for about 45 minutes here. They put them on a um, glucose infusion, and basically, and with their insulin kept constant, and they said how much glucose they needed to pump in to stop you going hypo. So before the exercise, just normal amounts. During the exercise, the amount of glucose that required really went high, as it did for the next 45 minutes, an hour or so after the exercise. Then it stayed nice and steady. And then about six or seven hours later, which if you did exercise in the evening is overnight, you can see the amount of glucose that was required was much higher. Therefore, the, the muscles and the liver are sucking up the glucose back from the blood. Therefore, you increase risk of going low overnight. So the key thing is you have to maybe reduce your insulin after eating. And you also have to think about reducing your insulin or having extra carbs before bed to prevent you going low if the exercise is after 4 p.m. If it's before 4 p.m., you're probably going to be okay. So that's a lot of information, but that's to give you the background to some tables that I'm about to show you that we use at the children's hospital, and maybe there might be something coming in the SPAD guidance that looks something similar that hopefully puts this in something for you to have a look at. But before I show you these, you need to understand that these tables are based on studies from a small number of subjects who are usually adult males. They're usually the plans that they tried. They either just tried the before exercise plan or the after exercise plan. Very rarely did they actually do the two or three things together. And there is a huge variability in what happens to your glucose response after. So some days it stays okay, some days it goes high, some days it goes low. And even if you follow the same plan with what you think are the same conditions. And this really, really good graphic by uh, Dr. Riddell, uh, and Ann Peters basically shows why. So this is why the glucose level may decrease. This is why the glucose level may increase. This is kind of what happens on an average, but the variability is huge. Why? Because exercise type, duration, intensity changes. The time of day changes. If you're someone who's got a lot of honeymoon still knocking about with your own insulin producing production, that, that causes some issues. Insulin on board, as we've said. Um, when was your last meal? Competition stress, fitness, your gender, um, what was your sleep quality like? So this is just to say, when you've got a plan, you don't necessarily, number one, it's not going to work the first time, and number two, it's not necessarily going to reproduce the exact same results. But what they are is a decent place to start if you're starting out on planning exercise and you currently don't have plans that work. So thinking for multiple day injections, it looks a bit complicated, but we're going to break it down. So we already know what type of exercise that we're potentially going to be doing. Aerobic, mixed or anaerobic. So we're going to say here we're going to do uh, something aerobic, maybe a jog. 
for an hour, let's say. And then you go with the starting plan if you haven't already got a plan, and it tells you the meal before exercise, mealtime insulin, if it's within two hours, ideally keep it between 60 to 90 minutes, but if it's within two hours, think about a 50% reduction of your insulin before, and then after a 50% reduction, and then if the exercise is after 4 p.m., you could reduce your evening basal insulin by 20%, or have a snack about 0.4 grams per kilo of body weight, before bed if you're not gonna have um, an insulin reduction without insulin, of course, only if your glucose level is less than 10 or, or say less than seven. So that's where you would start. And we're gonna go do an example here now to show you what that would look like. So Greg here is running at 10 a.m. for one hour. Having breakfast at 8.30, 60 grams of carbs, one to 10, six units. So that should be six units, but because he's gonna do running within the two hours, gonna reduce that by 50%, so that will be three units of insulin beforehand. Obviously, we want to test the glucose before and halfway through every half an hour. Um, because Greg weighs 40 kilos, we're gonna do half a gram for every kilo he weighs, 40 times by half gives you 20 grams for one hour, 10 grams for every 30 minutes. But you'd only give those carbs depending on if the glucose level was in target and maybe trending down as we've discussed before. So that would manage the before and during. And then afterwards, lunch at 12, 100 grams of carbs, 10 units, 50% reduction, so we'll only give five of those units. Now, because the exercise is before 4 p.m., you would not need to do anything before bedtime here because that insulin sensitivity, the main part of it would have um, happened later in the evening, so you wouldn't need to do anything overnight. So that's a basic place to start. But let's just say you do, Greg did this, but this first time that he did it, he went really high because he reduced the insulin by 50%. Well, next time you'd only reduce it by 25%. So in this case, you would do minus 25, which would take a unit and a half off, and you would have give four and a half units the next time. So they're just a simple way of a starting plan and then how to adapt your plans based on what happens from the results. So again, these tables are based off evidence, a limited evidence base, but they're a reasonable place to start. You'll need to discuss with your clinicians, but gives you some ideas to think about the before, during and after management of exercise. Obviously, if you're on an insulin pump, it gives you a couple more options. You can adjust to the basal rate. So let's have a little think about that. You've pretty much got the same tables, apart from this time, you can adjust the basal rate before exercise if you're not eating within two hours before. If you're eating within two hours before, just concentrate on reducing the bolus conditions because realistically, the amount of insulin you get from a bolus completely swamps the amount of basal insulin. However, if you've made sure, as I discussed before, that you've kept your last meal three hours before, you can then tinker with the basal conditions. So ideally, you'd want to put a temporary basal rate on two hours before or 90 minutes before you started. And then, for example, um, maybe, uh, in the aerobic one that we said before, if you had the same, if you had the same person this time, because the meal would be more than three hours before, you'd have the full insulin, and then you could have just put a fifty percent basal reduction on a couple of hours before, and then carried on with the plan as usual. But let's think of a different example now. If someone's on a pump, so John is now playing football, which is mixed exercise at seven p.m. for one hour. Evening meal is within this two-hour slot. So again, we'd want to think about a 50% reduction of insulin here. Test the glucose halfway before. Now, when we're thinking about um, amounts of glucose that we want to give to someone, you always try to cap the weight calculations at 60 kilos because if you go up to as much as one gram per kilo or one gram per minute, that's as much as the body can absorb. So cap the weight cal calculations at 60 kilos. 60 times by half a gram, 30 grams for the hour, 15 grams every 30 minutes and you only give the extra carbs if um, the glucose value and trend arrow suggests so. So this would be done before, manage the before, the before and during, and then after it's finished, having a snack of 40 grams, which would be normally four units, a reduction this time by 25%. So take off a unit, we we'll give three units, and then before bed, because the exercise is after 4 p.m., you've got two options. You could reduce the basal insulin by putting a temporary basal rate on until 3 a.m., or for six hours of um, reduction by 20%. Or if you didn't want to do that and you want the extra food, again, capping the calculations at 60 kilos, 60 times by 0.4 will give you a 24 gram carb snack without insulin if the glucose level is less than seven. So if you followed this plan, 
but the glucose level dropped after the exercise, well, next time you would do a 50% reduction here. You would go, oh, we'll take half of this off. And instead of four units, we'd give two. And then maybe we'll put a 40% basal reduction on overnight. So again, these tables just give you an option of how you can adjust your plans based on what happens from your experiences with trying them. And again, these are for informational purposes only. Please check with your provider if you're going to consider what we have done is put some calculators together where I work. So this, this process seems a little bit laborious, which it kind of is, and it is for me every time that I need to make a plan for someone. So what we have done is develop some calculators where you can put in the information that we've just discussed and it spits you out a plan. For example, running at five o'clock for 50 minutes. Last meal was more than four hours ago. So no bolus reduction at the meal four hours before, but you can reduce the basal 50% for 90 minutes before. Follow the carb suggestions below based on glucose value and trend arrow. And then afterwards you can reduce the meal insulin by 50% and think about the options for overnight. So it just makes it simplified for you. Again, you might want to discuss those with your uh, people who support your care when you get access to the resources later. So in summary, Continuous glucose monitoring, we know that accuracy deteriorates during exercise, so think about setting the low alert a bit higher. Do not worry, or you should, think about doing finger pricks if you've got arrows going straight down. If in doubt, get the meter out to be sure. Think about 10 minutes in terms of where the glucose is going to be, and then think about how you can simply adjust the usual carb amounts you have based on the, the trend arrows going up or down with a simple idea of whatever you would normally have. If you've got a double arrow down, double it. If you've got a single arrow down, give half extra. If the glucose levels with the arrow up, half what you normally have. If you've got a double arrow, don't give any. You can get obviously those carb calculator resources at glucoseneverlies.com and you've now got some pump and MDI plans for um, to consider with your healthcare professionals. If you want some of the resources like the calculators, etc., you can hover your phone over there and you can get the calculators on there. So I hope you found that useful. That's the sort of stuff that I've been presenting um, sort of around the globe to other healthcare professionals, helping them support people with diabetes. But as I said, forgetting the most important people who are yourselves who are hopefully watching, who have picked up some tips, tricks, and things that you can try after discussing with your healthcare professional, of course. Um, and yeah. Hit me up on Twitter at, at MM640G. And yeah, nice one.